Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Academy Governor Kate Amend. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of my fellow governors, Rory Kennedy and Roger Ross Williams, who is also a nominee tonight, <laughs> I'd like you wel to welcome you to our Oscar Week event celebrating this year's nominated films in the documentary short and the documentary feature categories. So thank you for being here, everyone. I'd like to begin by quoting a couple of presidents. <laughs> Cheryl Boone Isaacs, <laughs> our Academy president, said at the recent nominees luncheon, art has no borders, art has no language, and it doesn't belong to a single faith. Deborah Borda, the president of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Association wrote in a recent LA Times article, the arts breed compassion. And documentary is indeed an art form that has no borders, that breeds compassion and empathy and insight into our common humanity. And that's what all the filmmakers honored here tonight have succeeded so brilliantly in doing. You all have made some of the most outstanding films of the year, and your peers have recognized you for that. So we are here to celebrate you and to thank you for having the vision, the courage, and the stamina to do the work that you do. We are all grateful, and you are all winners in our eyes. In the first half of the program tonight, I'll be talking with the, do, uh, the filmmakers in the documentary short category. And in the second half, Rory Kennedy will be uh, talking with the feature documentary nominees. So we'll begin with the shorts. <coughs> Watching these incredible films, the word heroism leapt to my mind. The heroism of risking your life to rescue drowning refugees from the sea or digging people out from under buildings collapsed by airstrikes and bombs. The heroism to create a new life in a foreign country when you are forced to abandon your homeland. The heroism to face grave illness and to make end of life decisions. The heroism to survive the Holocaust and offer a lifeline to a new generation. And I think these filmmakers are heroic too and you're about to see why. So fasten your seat belts, and let's enjoy some moments from this year's nominated documentary shorts. Extremis, directed by Dan Krause. There are very few things that you can be 100% certain about. And you risk hurting people if you're wrong. My concern is if we continue to draw it out and we continue to do more and more things to her, we're going to cause more suffering without likely benefit. When I was a young attending, I had been asked to go put a large catheter in someone's neck. She was dying. And I went into life-saving mode. Right before we were getting ready, I look up and I see this nurse in the doorway. And she looked at me, locking eyes with me, and said, call the police. They're torturing a patient in the ICU. My heart dropped into my stomach. And I realized, oh my gosh, she's right. What I'm doing right now is not going to help her. It's not going to get rid of this disease that's killing her. And I don't want to do that anymore. Living homeless, debilitated, failure to thrive. He's been institutionalized for a long time now. We're just keeping a close eye on you to make sure you're feeling all right. Okay. Do you have any family members or anybody that is part of your family? 
Well, I'm sorry? Not that I know of. Well, we'll help take care of you then. If we're going to treat, the treatment is the ventriculostomy. And so if you guys don't agree with that, and if you say, tell me, nope, this guy would want everything done, he'd want to live, even if he was vegetative, on a ventilator for his life with a feeding tube, then the treatment is to put the ventric in. I don't feel that he is able to make those decisions, and I don't feel that we have someone who can really make them for him. We don't really know his prognosis. We don't know if he ever had capacity for decision making. So the ethics of this are murky. Do you like to make your own medical decisions, or do you like the doctors to make the decisions for you? get clear, we're not going to give them a chance to opt out and we're just going to do what we do with all of our patients, which is just plug them in and let them die on machine. How would you feel if you were not getting better on a breathing machine? I know I don't want to see him go, you know, because I haven't lost a parent yet, you know, so I wouldn't know how I feel, you know, so. We're wondering if maybe this is the point where we kind of need to stop, decide, and maybe have put the tube in, kind of put you to sleep, and have the machine help breathe for you. I didn't make that choice. It's a, it's some, for some people it's an easy choice, and for some people it's not. I'm 38. I know you're 38. Grandma. I know. I don't want to give my life away yet. I know. Oh. 4.1 Miles, directed and produced by Daphne Matsiraki. Τα πράγματα ήταν ελεγχόμενα, ήρεμα, δεν υπήρχε ένταση στη δουλειά μας. Καλό μας είναι να κάνουμε τους γιατρούς, ενώ δεν είμαστε, ούτε έχουμε εκπαιδευτεί για πρώτες βοήθειες και αυτό. Η αναλογία είναι ασύγκριτη. Δέκα άτομα κάθε ώρα που περνάει. Καλό μας να φέρουμε εις πέρας μία εισρωή ανθρώπων της τάξης 200 άτομα την ώρα. Η βάρκα πού είναι? Βάει ξέρω, η βάρκα είναι έναν άνθρωπο που λέει πάνω σε ένα ξύλο. Έτσι τον είπαν στο σταθμό. Καλώς, θα πάμε εμείς. Έφυγες, έφυγες. Έλα, έλα, φύγε, φύγε, Κυριάκο. Εντάξει, θα περάσουμε τώρα. Είναι οκ όλα.
Joe's Violin, directed and produced by Kahane Cooperman, produced by Rafaela Nehausen. We have very exciting news to share with you all today. Today, we are receiving a very special violin. There's a man named Joseph, and Joseph is a Holocaust survivor. His hope is that it'll bring a similar happiness and comfort to a young life. And we are choosing one student to play on it during their time here at Big League. And the student that we have chosen, she really shows a unique ability to show her emotion through her violin. So we are so excited to announce that the student that we have chosen is Brianna. My name is Brianna Perez. I'm 12 years old, about to be 13 in a month. And I'm currently in the seventh grade. I've known her since she was in first grade, and it's just been amazing to see her grow up into a young lady. I had a huge obsession when I was younger with Tinkerbell, and I kind of still do. She's like an independent, hardworking fairy. And um, she was chosen for something special, and I was chosen for something special too. When she's playing the violin, she, she transforms herself totally. It's like she's going inside of the music. Family is everything. I live with my mom. My father, he lives like across town, I guess. I didn't notice that she took my husband and my break so hard. Until one day that I saw her crying and she started playing the violin. And she told me that, I believe it's my fault. And I said, no, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Everyone has those days where it's like dark for them, but most people find their light. And my light is playing the violin. Brianna has been presented with some challenges that here in the school, everyone has really assisted her to overcome. It's such a joy to teach you every single day here at school. You display, uh, 
You display a passion for music that is very rare. We know, Brianna, that you will cherish this violin and enjoy playing on it just as Joseph did. So proud of you. So happy for you. <laughs> Joseph's gonna be very excited. Joseph is gonna be very excited. You should invite him. Yeah, He's you should. Yeah, he always wants We're to be a survivor of the holiday. We're hoping he can come. That would be really special. Schubert's Polonaise for violin and orchestra. WQXR. Classical 105.9 FM. Time for your morning buff. So I found myself in Siberia, in a labor camp. Life was very tough. Temperature kept dropping, just colder and colder. They allowed us to write a letter once a month. So I sent the letter to my mother, and I received a reply. My mother wrote out the lyrics of Solveig song, which was very appropriate to her a mother who is missing her son. I, I sang it. Yeah, I still remember it very well. It's amazing how we were chosen out of everyone. It looks like a violin, but it's way more. It's way, way more. more, more it's like there's so many secrets, and that violin has so many secrets that nobody knows. Tawny, My Homeland, directed and produced by Marcel Metelsiefen, produced by Stephen Ellis. كنت انزل على الملعب كل يوم مع اولاد عمتي ومع قرايبيني وبدي افتقد الاكل حتى الاكل مع اخواتي وقت كنا ناكل بدي افتقد عيشتي بحلب بدنا نفتقد اني ايمت اجت كهرباء وايمت انقطعت ايمت اجت المي وايمت انقطعت بدي افتقد مدرستي ورفقاتي كثير 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 باي باي حلب باي باي مدرستي باي باي رفقاتي باي باي اولاد عمتي باي باي نانتي بدي اشتاق لكم كثير 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 I'm 
爸爸。أنا أحياناً بحسد اللي عم بيموتوا يعني أخيراً لاقوا محل يستقروا فيه ولو كان بقبر بس خلاص ارتاح وما عاد يفكروا وين بدهم يقعدوا يعني أنا نسيت أولادي فترة أنا وأبوهم وعطينا للثورة وللعناصر وللناس و... بس بحق أولادي كمان أنا أعطيهم شيء هل الأولاد هدول إذا نحن هلأ عملنا لهم مستقبل يرجع يفيد وطنهم يرجع يبنون جديد The White Helmets, directed by Orlando von Einsiedel, produced by Joanna Natasegra. كل الناس يعني أو بمعنى كلهم غاليين. إن كان طفل يعني غير إنه كان ابني شعور لا يوصف. يعني كمثال رح أذكر لك حادث صار معنا بحلب. بمنطقة اسمها الأنصاري تعرضت منطقة الأنصاري للقصف ببرميلين متفجرين الأول يعني أوقع عدد من الجرحى بس البرميل الثاني اللي هو اللي, اللي وقع عدد كبير من الشهداء دخلنا أول ما دخلنا طبعا هي منطقه مثل شبه ضيعه هي عباره عن شي عشر بيوت على الارض كل البيوت على الارض بهذاك اليوم يعني كان العمل شاق و... وضلينا تقريبا عم نعمل بفتره 16 ساعه وانا بكل اعتقادي وتصوري وانا عم بشتغل وبعمل تحت الانقاض انه عم ببحث على طفل يعني ميت بس سبحان الله الله بده ما يخلينا نطلع نغادر المكان الا انه نطالع او نسمع صوت مجرد سماع الصوت شعوري آه يعني لا يوصف شعوري ما شفت الطفل فهذا خلانا هيك اعطانا 
اللي هو انه نتابع عملنا اكثر واكثر واعطانا امل بانه معناتها في اشخاص لسه عايشين انه بعد 16 ساعة وتحت الركاب طفل ليتجاوز عمره الشهر على قيد الحياة وبين الغبار وبين الركاب وبين الاسقف اللي كانت منهار عليه لذلك سمينا طفل معجزة الولد كان عمره أسبوع وأنا بهداك الوقت كان جايني عبودة عبد الحميد كان عمره تقريبا أسبوعين فما بعرف الشيك اللي دخل لمخيلتي إنه تخيلت إنه هذا ابني وصرت أبكي بهداك الوقت يعني ما تحملت الموقف صرنا نبكي أنا ورفقاتي كلياتهم these filmmakers up to the stage. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, you have your names on your... extraordinary. <laughs> I'd like to start by having each of you introduce yourself and which film you're with and tell us what compelled you to make this film. We'll start with Dan. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for coming tonight. And man, I, I feel so, uh, after watching all those clips, I just, I'm so proud to be shoulder to shoulder with all of you. Um, what an extraordinary group of films. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so my name is Dan Krauss. I directed Extremis. Um, thank you. Um, your question was, uh, what, drew, what compelled me to do the story? Uh, absolutely nothing compelled me to do the story at first. Um, I was um, urged to go into the ICU at the behest of the physician who you saw featured in that clip. She said, you have to come and see what's happening in this unit. You have to hear the conversations we're having here. It's like nothing you've seen before. Uh, and she was right, but I, I really resisted um, the idea of, of filming in the ICU for, for quite a while. Um, it's a subject I'm not comfortable with. Um, it's a subject that scares me. And uh, I think it scares a lot of us. Um, and I think you know, that's perhaps one of the reasons that I ended up pursuing the film. Um, sometimes I think what we do is move in the direction of our fear. That's our mandate. And um, uh, working on this film uh, was my way of dealing with a subject that uh, I'm, I'm not comfortable addressing in my own life. Wow. You did a great job. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, thank you so much uh, for being here, everyone. Thank you all. I'm so uh, proud as well and honored to be among all of you. Incredible films. Next, my professor, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, incredible films. Um, what compelled me? Um, what compelled me was that um, when I was um, reading everything about the refugee crisis that was um, picking last year, uh, and the epicenter of it was my home country, Greece, uh, I was here and I felt very kind of removed and detached from it all still. Uh, and then I realized that the people who are in the forefront, uh, the front line of it, um, 
were the Greek Coast Guard, people who are very everyday people, had a very easy life, uh, were uh, possibly also detached from the situation. They're not rescuers, they're not um, doctors, they're not volunteers. Um, they used to do a very easy job and suddenly they're hit uh, with the biggest refugee crisis. And um, it's they have to rescue people who are not only um, having to flee their homes because of this terrible war, but then they have to get smuggled and have to die uh, making this terrible crossing um, when nobody helps them uh, with a safe, to provide them with a safe passage. And these, um, these people who are in the front lines are, for me, um, complete modern day heroes, uh, just because um, the, the main character, the, the captain of this uh, boat, I think he just recognizes that these people only ask for one thing, which is just dignity to live. Uh, and I think that's very rare in our days, unfortunately. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm Kahani Cooperman, I directed Joe's Violin, and I'm also very honored to be amongst these wonderful filmmakers with these powerful films and here tonight, it's an unbelievable honor. Um, so I was compelled to make this film because I've always been a very strong believer that um, everyone has a story if you just look below the surface, just a little. Um, and I was actually um, compelled by this one because I, I heard a 15 second promo for the radio station's instrument drive on driving my car. And it mentioned one of the donations they received, which was the violin of a 91 year old Holocaust survivor. Now, I didn't know if that violin had been purchased recently or had a story to it, but in my mind, I imagined there might be a story. And then I wondered if this, the, if the student, because they were going to give all the instruments to New York City school kids in need, if the student would ever know what that story was. And then I wondered what that child's story was. And by the time I sort of pulled into the parking lot of this you know, quick trip, I, this idea of two strangers being connected by a single musical instrument really compelled me. And the idea of the possibilities of this gentleman's small act having a potentially great impact was incredibly moving to me. So once I met with Joseph and learned about his story and who he was, um, I decided to follow and see what would happen with the violin. So that's where I'm going. Hi, I'm Raphaela Nehaus, and I produce Joe's Violin, and to echo the sentiments, I feel extremely honored to be in the company <laughs> I'm in tonight. Um, well, when Kahani told me about the film, pretty much everything about the story compelled me personally. I'm a first-generation immigrant. My grandparents survived the Holocaust, so Joe is basically like the people I grew up with and mm. that I miss so much because my grandparents have passed. And my family came from the Soviet Union in the 70s, so they were just you know immigrants in America believing in the American dream. So the whole Brianna story of her as a Dominican immigrant really compelled me. And the icing on the cake for me is my mother's a singer, and she grew up singing the songs that her grandparents taught her, and she's recorded them. So the whole idea of music connecting generations and you know, connecting me to even like my great grandparents that I never met was extremely moving. So Kahani never asked me to produce the film. She just <laughs> shared her idea for it. But once she told me, I really had no choice. I basically told her, I'm going to produce your film. And, <laughs> and we were done. So that was it. Oh, <laughs> So my name's Stephen Ellis. I produced Watani, My Homeland, with Marcel, my colleague. And um, <laughs> I think what compelled me to this film was something that must have compelled everyone on this stage. Uh, we, Marcel, met this family in 2013, this very special family that seemed to embody what was going on in Syria. This, this family that lived on the front line of this war zone, this war zone that was being destroyed in front of them. 2014, a year later, the father of the family was kidnapped by ISIS. And yet again, this family embodied the same story. They continued to do that as they escaped through to Germany. And 
this story that was unfolding was this story of great geopolitical relevance, this great, great relevance to what was happening around us, and just embodied in this one family, these three little, four little kids who could speak poetically about their pain. And I actually felt a need to make this film. And I think Marcel would agree, it was beyond compulsion. It was a necessity. Well, um, I am... Um, yeah, so my, my, my name is Marcel, Marcel Metalzik, and I directed the film What's in My Homeland. And um, as Stephen just said, uh, when I, I, 2013 I met this family, I wanted to do a film about the Syrian uprising uh, through the eyes of children, and I was looking for children, and I met this uh, incredible family, each of uh, them <coughs> been full of poetry, and this is basically... Um, the, the, what you wish if, if you're looking for strong characters. But it was not only this, I was able to, to gain a trust of a female Muslim family, of a, uh, of a world which had been basically totally un, unseen uh, throughout uh, the entire uh, three years I've been covering Syria. And I was feeling that uh, very honored and very that, that I was able to tell those stories. And I think they uh, realized that since uh, the Islamic State, uh, or the upcoming Islamic State there, 2013 has been um, hijacking uh, basically the entire narrative of what's going, uh, like the news coming out of this country and, uh, and basically the entire religion that they need to open up in order to, to have a counterbalance, a, a counter narrative. And uh, so it was, it, it was again, a proof in order to s say what kind of nature this family was, uh, to just say, we need uh, this part of the story being told. And I, I was happy that I, I was able to tell the story. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm Orlando von Einzadal. Um, I directed The White Helmets. Thank you. Um, we, myself and Joanna, we, we first came across this. We, some friends showed us the, the footage you just saw of um, the, the baby being rescued, this newborn baby being pulled out of the rubble after a barrel bomb strike. And this footage is obviously incredibly moving. But what we found um, particularly compelling is when we found out who the rescue workers were, this group of ordinary Syrian civilians, people just like everyone in this room, bakers, tailors, builders, um, people who had all decided not to pick up weapons, um, not to fight and not to flee Syria, and instead had all decided to stay and every day go out and risk their lives to save their fellow citizens and complete strangers. We found that incredibly moving. Um, and it's also, it's a story of heroes, it's a story of hope. And Syria is so upsetting, it, this war's been going on for six years, it's so easy to disengage with it because, because we all feel so helpless. But this was a story that, that we believed could resonate, it certainly resonated with us, and, that, and that's what drew us in. Um, I'm Joanna Nascar, and produced White Helmets, and... Um, I think uh, it just to say, as well as being honoured to be on this stage, what an important year, not just for us as a cohort, but also for the feature docs and for documentary in general. It's it's time that documentary you know regains its strength. So I'm really pleased to be here with you guys. Um, I think for just to add to what Orlando said, we are also compelled as filmmakers to make stories about subjects that we feel utterly humbled by. Our last film, we felt very, very humbled by the work of the Rangers in Varunga National Park. Um, and we, you know, after we finished making that film, we thought, well, who else could inspire us to that level? And, and we didn't think anybody could until we came across the story of the White Helmets. And, uh, and they managed to at least equal, if not beat, that inspiration. And I think, um, I think it's always important to work you know, for, in, in the service of people that you feel inspired by. Well, damn. <laughs> I'm, it, it's kind of shocking to hear you say that you were just terrified of, 
facing this because um, the film is so intimate and you, you feel like you're in the room with these people, um, particularly the families that you followed. So tell you shot it, right? Can you talk a little bit about how you gained their trust and how you were able to be in there for these incredible life or death moments? Well, you have to imagine <clears throat> approaching someone on what may be the worst day of their life and asking to film it. It's really difficult. Um, I always went in, first without a camera, <clears throat> always with the introduction of a, a physician, and I just um, explained to them why I thought the film mattered. And um, I think for the people who, uh, for, you know, of course, many, many people declined to participate, <clears throat> the majority, the vast majority. Uh, the, the people that did agree to participate, I think, saw an opportunity to connect with others. So they saw the camera not as this intrusive presence, but rather <clears throat> as a conduit um, to not feel alone, um, to um, help other people who are facing similar challenges, um, to take what would otherwise be pure loss and transform it into uh, something that can make uh, other people and in their own lives uh, feel comforted and not so isolated. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges behind that curtain was finding the line that divides intimacy and intrusiveness and allowing the film to uh, be witness to these moments in a way that felt <clears throat> like we were being the gift, uh, we were being given the gift of, of this opportunity to witness these decisions being made without the camera feeling like it was somehow trampling on the sacredness of that space. Um, and that took some figuring out and it took a lot of uh, time with these families, sometimes without the camera, to develop a language and an understanding that made everyone feel comfortable. Yeah, because you felt the dignity mm -hmm. of all of them um, and that clearly they trusted you and they felt comfortable letting you be there. Yeah, I think um, I had some rules of my own um, that weren't my sort of foundational tenets for the filming um, to allow these patients to have the, the dignity that they deserved and that they <coughs> um, would be remembered with. And, and um, you know, I, I never filmed a patient dying. I never filmed a patient, uh, you know, uh, being changed, uh, being fed through a tube. Um, these were things that didn't help me um, advance the message of the story. And so dignity was always the kind of hallmark rule for filming. Um, these patients gave a lot of it, and I wanted to respect it. Daphne. <laughs> well, you're the captain is just incredible, and like you said, they're ordinary people, these Coast Guard um, captains, and um, how did you convince them to let you <laughs> go out on the ship with them and to film? Um, it probably took a while. It took a, it took a very long time. Um, when, when I realized um, that I wanted to tell this story, um, through his eyes and I wanted to be on this Coast Guard boat because it was so important to be there because uh, it was there when these two worlds were I, are actually colliding. Mm -hmm. uh, the world of our comfort zone and this other reality that is uh, still a reality. Um, I contacted uh, everyone that I knew in the Greek Ministry of uh, <laughs> Maritime and uh, they wouldn't let me to go on this boat uh, because they don't let any filmmakers and any journalists to go on the boat because it's unsafe. Um, uh, but I really convinced them. Uh, I persisted and I convinced them that it was very important to tell this story from that boat and through his eyes. Um, and I hadn't spoken to this, the captain uh, until I was on the airport uh, about to fly to Greece. I finally reached him <laughs> on the phone and I, and I said to him, um, um, 
are there any boats crossing? What is the situation? And he said to me, um, just, just come here and see with your own eyes. I really don't have any world, words to explain to you the situation. So in his voice, I really understood uh, the weight of the situation. I really understood how, um, how much uh, uh, he's caring, uh, how much this responsibility uh, that he has means and the psychological uh, effect that it has on him. So I realized that he was, he immediately that he was the one that I would tell this story uh, through. And when I met him in person, I, as soon as I arrived on the island, he was a man that um, he had nothing to hide. Um, he let me into his life and trusted me completely. And I think the trust and is something very important uh, for uh, documentary filmmaking and journalism. Um, he realized that I wanted to tell a, a truthful uh, story of what exactly is going on with no sensationalizations or anything, just tell what's happening. And because he feels so alone there, because there is no help, um, he's been carrying him and three other colleagues and their four member crews have been carrying the weight of this entire refugee crisis um, in the middle of the, the water of a peaceful country, Greece, uh, which is also bankrupt and has no means to support this. Um, he, like, I feel the rest of the people that were being rescued, the rest of the people on the island, they, and there is somebody on the film saying that they, needed, they need the world to see it. So he completely let me into mm. his life because of that. Well, that is good. <laughs> well there, there's a moment where, um, is he the one that tells you to put the camera down? Tell yeah, um, that's interesting. I opened the film, I decided to open the film with this scene uh, when um, the captain brings up a baby and he tells me, put the camera down, hold the baby. And I opened this scene, the film with this scene because before I went there, I had this huge ethical dilemma uh, about what my role is as a, as a filmmaker. What would I do if I see people drowning? And you know, would I put the camera down and jump in the water and rescue them? What would I do? And I decided that my role is that I'm a filmmaker and I needed to just tell this story the way it is in the most accurate uh, way and honest way and give justice to the people. Um, but being on the boat, the situation was entirely different. Uh, like I mentioned <laughs> before, these people um, are not even trained to do this. They are not trained to do CPR. They were just, uh, their job was to do routine border patrol and they're just caught in the middle of this. So they're just as shocked as I am. And everyone on this tiny boat is completely shocked. So, and the situation is frantic and chaotic and everyone, including me, are in the, f in the middle of this just fine line between life and death. And at this moment, when he tells me, put the camera down and hold this baby, I honestly couldn't care less about making a film. Yeah. So <laughs> I did what he told me. <laughs> That's great. So Connie, um, I read that there were 3,000 instruments donated in this, <laughs> in this instrument drive, um, but you heard about Joseph initially, so how did he respond to? So when I first heard about, it was the, it was the promo, it mentioned two um, donations, a flute from Brooklyn and a violin from the Upper West Side, <laughs> um, which I thought was a trombone when I wrote to the radio station, but I was corrected. Um, and um, so I, I had to first earn the trust of the people at the radio station. They felt like you know, this gentleman had donated his violin and they didn't want to, for obvious reasons, just give his contact information away. So I, I, you know, worked to gain their trust and tell them where I was coming from, that I thought there was something potentially beautiful in the idea of two strangers who live in the same city who don't know each other that are going to be connected by this violin. I did not know yet where the violin, what school it was going to go to or what young girl it was going to go to, but I thought it based on you know, 
what I imagine the story might be that it could be worth it. So uh, jo they contacted Joseph mm -hmm. and um, he couldn't for the life of him understand why anyone would be interested in him <laughs> at all. Um, but still let me come and I knocked on his door and I spent about an hour with him. So I learned indeed there was a very extremely poignant story attached to this violin. And, and also that at 91 um, that he was going to be able to tell it in his own words. Um, so I, le I left, you know, that hour meeting in his apartment knowing that I, I wasn't sure what would happen, but I wanted to find out, so I started to follow, follow it. And it ended up really, um, you know, these two people who are born 80 years apart, completely different cultural backgrounds, um, both use music to get through hardships. Um, you know, the hardship in the film that we show Brianna facing um, is the surface of what she deals with in life. We needed to respect her privacy, um, but it's an indication of some of the darker things in her life. Um, and so even though the darkness that Joseph experienced during World War II and the darkness that she has faced as a young girl growing up in the poorest congressional district in the country are very different, they both use music to, and the violin specifically, to get them through things, to channel their emotions. And I felt like there was something so powerful in that bond. And the fact that when they did meet, which was another, I didn't know if they would connect, but they connected in such a deep way. She's a very unusual 12-year-old girl who understood intrinsically the intangible value of this piece of wood. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really remarkable yes, and very yeah. moving and they're still mm -hmm. they they love each other and they're still in touch <laughs> and it's just a really That's amazing true. thing. And so he, you know, she he gave the gift of the violin, but really he he got this incredible gift back that this he's now um almost 94 and in the la his last couple years of his life have been unbelievably <laughs> exciting. <laughs> He's so excited. He still doesn't understand why anyone's interested, <laughs> but, but he's so moved and loves Brianna, and Brianna loves him, and, you know, she understands the history of it, and, it's, you know. Yeah, this, the scene where they meet is just wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It was very moving at the time. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it was. Well, Br Brianna was. Yeah. <laughs> you brought Brianna here um, for the nominees luncheon. Is she going to come to the? Oh, she's coming. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I have to say, after the nominee luncheon, she flew back to New York and the next day went back to being a grade nine student. So we're, we have no idea how she's processing any of this, but she's extremely excited and she's going to be flying out on Saturday. And her mom is coming, which she was the most excited about, the mo her mom that's in the movie. That's fantastic. And her yeah. teacher. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, I mean, she really did sense the importance of this of this gift and she you you got that feeling from her that no in incredibly i mean as kahani alluded to like we've never met such a poised 12 year old girl that was just so deep and profound and we'd we'd often joke that if we'd written this as a fiction film nobody would have believed it everybody would have said no she can't say that kids don't say that but she really did and um <laughs> she no she's all heart and she like as kahani was saying like their relationship they're pen pals and when they see each other like they're holding each other the whole time at screenings and like it's a very deep deep relationship for both of them and how they connected that's wonderful. Yeah, and I think I think for Joseph, it's also exciting because you know he is he's turning ninety four next month, and he did what he thought was a really simple thing. He just gave away an instrument. He doesn't use it, and nowhere in his wildest dreams did he imagine it would go to somebody like Brianna, and you know what would ensue from that. So. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, Marcel, you've, you've been to uh, Syria quite a bit, I understand. Do you want to tell us a little uh, bit more about 
how you were able to travel there so much and and I know that something that's missing from the clip that we saw is the father. Um, yeah, um, so I, I, I started actually um, 2011 to uh, cover Syria as a still photographer. So I am uh, pretty uh, new into filmmaking. It was Syria who um, was the reason why I first uh, started to do a video. <coughs> because uh, it was the only way to get into the country uh, to get a visa as a doctor and not as a... Uh, Jorge. Uh, exactly, I had a, f a double name, my mother's South American, so I, I applied uh, with my first name, which nobody knows that I, I'm a still photographer since 15 years, been covering a lot of conflict, uh, and uh, I could use my first name, Jorge uh, Metelsiefen, which uh, you can't... Google it up, but you would never find uh, me, Marcel Metelsiefen, <laughs> the, the photographer. So, uh, and I uh, was in medical school, so I was the uh, doctor, Jorge Metelsiefen, who applied for a student visa to study Arabic. Uh, and so I was not able to take my, my big camera, my photo camera, uh, and I instead uh, would take pictures with my iPhone for Spiegel. And uh, the first time I took a no normal camcorder. And it, it, this was the reason why that I could the first year, 2011, to understand what it means that if th how does a movement cr be is created, how this clandestine world works. And, um, and this was actually the, the, the most important reason why I was able still 2013 to go into the country because I would been traveling so many times in and out that I had a huge network of people on the ground who would help me uh, to, to go in and, and to go out again safely. And uh, in 2013, um, when I decided to do the film uh, Through the Eyes of Children, uh, I had known the father of this wonderful children from previous trips. And I, uh, I met him again and I asked him uh, that I need children. He said, the only children who are in this part of Aleppo, in this front line, which I thought it's, it's visual, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to find children there. I said, it's my own children. And then I started following them. The children are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, the, the, the children are extraordinary. And I think uh, w w what by following them and Stephen and me uh, uh, been able to, to, to kind of tell the story of over three years. So it was 2013, and I think the last uh, bit of uh, video we, we shot was uh, in 2015. 15, uh, 16, uh, yeah, 16 actually, yeah. 16 in, in, in April. So uh, you, you, s you, s you meet the family in, in Aleppo, you get to know them, you, uh, and you understand why they have to leave, and you understand uh, by how they arrived to Germany, and the inability or the ability of the children, who are very f easy to adapt uh, and uh, into their new environment, uh, that, uh, and the mother is trapped still in her, uh, in her past, uh, emotionally trapped, uh, and you understand the most important part, which for me, being German, uh, I thought is the message I want to get out there, uh, that if she would have been able to choose, she never would have left. And uh, I think uh, you can see by the way of how she's been mourning, and that's why the film name Watani, which is uh, my homeland, the, the desperate kind of mourning for a, a homeland they lost, uh, I wanted to get this message out that people are not coming to abuse our welfare system, uh, just they're not able to survive in their own country. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> when when the, the, the young boy says, forgive us, Syria, that just so me. Stephen, do you want to talk about editing? Well, I think you know, one of the things that's hard about uh, a film like this is when do you stop? You know, you could s we could still be making this film. We could still be making this film in ten years' time, and um, I hope we won't still be making films like this in ten years' time. And I hope that the world settles down around us, actually. But um, I think one of the one of the things that we tried to do was make a film that was very much about psychological change. That everything was about the psychological change in these children and in the mother. And if it, if if the if the any aspect of it diverged from that, then it kind of wasn't necessary in the film. The process and the context sat away from all of that. It was all just about what 
these kids perceived. And in that way, we wanted to make a film that really showed the pure innocence of these kids, of people going through an uh, absolute crisis, unbiased by the religion or politics of the environment. And uh, we struggled to make this film, really tried to finish it in 2014, again in 2015, again in 2016, tried to find this, this kind of end point. And then the eldest daughter, uh, who was at this stage kind of becoming, you know, a little bit of a German teenager, was being a bit resistant to filming. And Marcel showed some of the footage from of, of the father from the very beginning of the film, where he talks about the sacrifice that he's making to keep them on the front line. And um, she reflects on that, and she gives the line that actually currently finishes the film. She says, now I understand the sacrifices that my dad made. Now I understand the sacrifices that my mum made. I understand the meaning of, of Homeland. And at that point, we kind of knew that we had at least one close, you know, at least one end to a film. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, you told their story beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> now, the White Helmets, you're speaking of children and in a war zone, um, you're saying that it originated by seeing the, the footage uh, of the baby being rescued. So did you um, go to Syria and, and then work with these? There's, there's thousands of these, the White Helmet rescue people, right? There's, there's 3,000 of them, yeah. yeah. Um, no, no, we didn't go to Syria. We, we've actually, it's funny, a lot, a lot of our careers we spent making films in, in conflict zones. But in this case, we shot this film at the beginning of last year. And at that point, about uh, for about nine months before that, there'd been virtually no Western journalists in eastern Aleppo because we, we've all tragically seen what happened to, to most of them um, and they ended up being kidnapped. So we realised at the beginning that we couldn't go and film there. And instead, we, we had a real opportunity to collaborate with the White Helmets themselves. They film a lot of their rescues because they want the world to see what's going on on the ground inside Syria. So they wear GoPro cameras and, and use small video cameras. And we worked very closely with a young white helmet called Halid Khatib, who began documenting the, the crisis in Syria at the age of 16. And he began doing that on his mobile phone and gradually got better and became an accomplished photographer. He's had his work in the New York Times. Um, and Halid, so th what we did is we filmed for five weeks on the border with about 30 white, white helmets. And Halid joined those white helmets. And he spent that time working very closely with our director of photography, Franklin Dow. Um, and Halid's an incredibly fast learner. And the, the small contribution that, that we could make as a film team was to help improve his documentary storytelling techniques. Um, and then at the end of those five weeks, when the White Helmets went back into Syria, into, into Aleppo, Halid continued to do his normal job of documenting their rescues, except he shared the material with us. Um, and that's what makes up the film, is, is what we shot on the border and what Halid shot inside Syria. <laughs> well, Joanna, I know that you use film for s social impact and outreach, and have you... Um, shown this this film yeah um yeah i mean we we actually made this film as a short partly because the issue was just so urgent so we had a, you know a fairly heated discussion actually at the beginning where we debated whether this would be a feature doc and certainly the material was was definitely there um but and this doesn't normally happen with producer and director but it was actually Orlando who said no it it has to be a short because we have to do it quickly we can't, you know, we can't, we can't take that time. These people need their story told, and to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, you know, and luckily we we showed we, we you know we distributed the film with Netflix, so that meant 190 countries, 21 languages. There's no other way to see that film that quickly, and it is an urgent story. So we feel like that was exactly the right move to make the film within one year. 
And then, you know, and then the film has been shown in various parliaments and shared around tastemakers and decision makers, high profile people. The White Helmets were actually nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize last year. And so, yeah, I mean, these people are incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a figure at the end of the film that you see that I think in the film is 58,000 lives that they've saved, which is already huge. And now, that figure is 82,000. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank all of you for your courage, your compassion, and your artistry. These films are all extraordinary. And I think they've changed your lives. They've probably changed the lives of the people in them. And they're having the same effect on all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, stay Stay in your seats, because Rory will be introducing the, docu the uh, feature doc filmmakers. Thank you. Please welcome Academy Governor Rory Kennedy. Is this working? There we go. Um, those were really incredible films. Thank you all again to all the shorts, really amazing work. And I want to take a moment and just thank the Academy. I um, think we would all agree that, that our voting process is working with all of the amazing films. So I want to thank all of the members for watching these films, for voting on them on, in record numbers. And I think that we would all agree that at least our democratic process here at the Academy is working very, very well. Um, um, but I do, I do want to say that, that given everything that is going on in, the, in our country today, I am so proud to be a documentary filmmaker. And I just love each and every one of these films that has been nominated here. And I'm so proud to have any vague association with them just as being a fellow documentary filmmaker. Um, you know, these, I'm gonna focus on the features now, but these films help us have such a deeper understanding of race in America, of what it means to be a refugee fleeing your country because of poverty and war and desperation, what it means to grow up as an aut autistic child. People don't read so much anymore these days, and they don't, and it's a shame, but they do watch films and they do watch documentaries. And documentaries really are providing people an outlet and one of the few places where they're getting in-depth knowledge about any particular issue. Democracy only works when we have an informed electorate and an informed public. So in my mind, d documentaries play a really critical role right now and for the, for the uh, next, well, four years. But um, I think these stories that you're telling and that you're sharing with us are helping to bridge a divide they can, um, and we are in a, a, in a divided nation, and they help connect us to our fellow citizens. Um, they ground us all in a common experience in watching these films, an experience that transcends politics and any acts of otherizing. When we watch these films, we feel, and we feel not because we're told to feel, but simply because we can't help ourselves, because these films are so good. So I want to thank all of the filmmakers. I want to thank you for your commitment, for your extraordinary talent, and for your work, and for giving us these, these gifts. You are fighting the good fight, which is all we can do, because in the end, we are all in this together. So I'm now, I have the great honor of introducing you to the clips of the feature films and looking forward to our discussion after watching those. Thank you all very much. Fire at Sea, 
Directed and produced by Gianfranco Rozzi. Produced by Donatella Palermo. Ottocentoquaranta erano in questa barca. C'erano quelli, quelli della, della prima classe, queste quelle della prima classe, perché erano fuori, avevano pagato 1500 dollari. Poi c'erano quelli della seconda classe che erano qua in mezzo, mi avevano pagato 1000 e poi che non sapevo giù nella stiva ce n'erano tantissimi avevano pagato 800 dollari la terza classe quando li ho fatti scendere praticamente non finivano mai mai centinaia di donne e bambini che stavano male soprattutto quelli che c'erano giù nella stiva perché da sette giorni che navigavano ed erano disidratati erano affamati ed erano stanchi mi ricordo ne, ne ho portati 68 qua al pronto soccorso e stavano male questo è un ragazzino si sì, è tutto ustionato giovanissimo ha avuto 14-15 anni di questi ne vediamo tantissimi sono ustioni, ustioni chimiche da carburante sì, perché li imbarcano su questi gommoni, no? gommoni fatiscenti, quindi devono durante la navigazione devono rimboccare le taniche con la benzina, questa benzina va per terra, insieme si miscela con l'acqua, poi si inzuppano i vestiti e questa miscela è deleteria, comporta queste ustioni gravissime che sono quelle che ci fanno tribulare e che ci fanno lavorare tantissimo e che purtroppo lasciano dei segni anche mortali. Ecco, è il dovere di ogni uomo che sia un uomo aiutare queste persone. E quando ci riusciamo siamo veramente contenti, siamo felici di avere dato una mano. A volte non è possibile purtroppo e quindi ti tocca assistere a cose anche brutte, bruttissime, morti, bambini. E in quell'occasione poi sono costretto a fare che è la cosa che più odio di tutte le ispezioni cadaveriche, no? Ne ho fatte tante, forse troppe. Molti mi dicono, amici miei, no? colleghi, ma ah, sì, tanto tu ne hai viste tante, sei abituato, non è vero. Come si fa a abituarsi a vedere bambini morti, donne incinte? donne che hanno partorito durante il naufragio, ancora attaccate al cordone ombelicale, no? E quindi le devi mettere nel, nel sacco, le devi mettere nelle casse, devi fare anche un prelievo, devi tagliare un dito, devi tagliare una costola, devi tagliare un orecchio, un bambino. Quindi dopo la morte anche quest'altra oltraggio però serve, serve e quindi lo faccio. Tutto questo ti lascia tanta rabbia, ti lascia un, un vuoto nello stomaco, un buco, ti fa pensare, ti li fa sognare. Per me sono degli incubi che rivivo spesso. Spesso. I am not your Negro, directed and produced by Raoul Peck, produced by Remy Groletti, produced by Hebert Peck. The church was packed. In the pew before me sat Marlon Brando, Sammy Davis, Erla Kitt, Sidney Poitier nearby. I saw Harry Belafonte sitting next to Coretta King. I have a childhood handover thing about not weeping in public, and 
I was concentrating on holding myself together. I did not want to weep for Martin. Tears seemed futile. But I may also have been afraid, and I could not have been the only one, that if I began to weep, I would not be able to stop. I started to cry, and I stumbled. Sammy grabbed my arm. The story of the Negro in America is the story of America. It is not a pretty story. Were you able to listen to the show backstage? I heard a deal of it, but then I was behind the bus brigade. Yes. So I heard only some of it. Did you hear anything that you disagreed with? Or I disagreed you... with a great deal of it. And, uh, of course, it's a good deal I agree with. But I think uh, he's overlooking one very important matter, I think. Each one of us, I think, is terribly alone. He lives his own individual life. He has all kinds of obstacles in the way of religion or color or size or shape or lack of ability. And the problem is to become a man. But what I was discussing was not that problem, really. I was discussing the difficulties, the obstacles, the very, the very real danger of death thrown up by the society when a Negro, when a black man attempts to become a man. All this emphasis upon black men and white does emphasize something which is here, but it emphasizes it or perhaps exaggerates it, and therefore makes us for, uh, put people together in groups which they ought not to be in. I have more in common with a, a black scholar than I have with a white man who is against scholarship. And you have more in common with a white author than you have with someone who's against all literature. So why must we always concentrate on color or on religion or this? There are other ways of connecting men. I'll tell you this. When I left this country in 1948, I left this country for one reason only, one reason. I didn't care where I went. I might have gone to Hong Kong. I might have gone to Timbuktu. I ended up in Paris on the streets of Paris with $40 in my pocket on the theory that nothing worse could happen to me there than it already happened to me here. You talk about making it as a writer by yourself, you had to be able then to turn off all the antenna with which you live because once you turn your back on this society, you may die. You may die. And it's very hard to sit at a typewriter and concentrate on that if you're afraid of the world around you. The years I lived in Paris did one thing for me. They released me from that particular social terror, which was not the paranoia of my own mind, but a real social danger visible in the face of every cop, every boss, Everybody. I don't know what most white people in this country feel, but I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. I don't know if white Christians hate Negroes or not, but I know that we have a Christian church which is white and a Christian church which is, which is black. I know as Malcolm X once put it, it's the most segregated hour in American life is high noon on Sunday. That says a great deal for me about a Christian nation. It means that I can't afford to trust most white Christians and certainly cannot trust the Christian church. I don't know whether the labor unions and their bosses really hate me. That doesn't matter, but I know I'm not in their unions. I don't know if the real estate lobby is anything Ooh, against black over. people, but I know the real estate lobbies keep me in the ghetto. I don't know if the, if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks that give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never I seen. I never seen. Life Animated, directed and produced by Roger Ross Williams, produced by Julie Goldman. Owen has said almost nothing but gibberish since then. We're beginning to give up hope. So on Walt's ninth birthday, he's in the backyard with his buddies. Party ends, the kids leave, and Walt gets a little weepy, a little emotional. And then Owen follows us into the kitchen, looking expectant, like he's looking at the two of us. He stands there, stock still, like something's bubbling up. And he says, Walter doesn't want to grow up. 
like Mowgli or Peter Pan. And off he runs. I was like, what the hell just happened? Did Owen just say Walter doesn't want to grow up like Peter Pan or Mowgli? Peter Pan doesn't want to grow up because he wants to stay a boy and be in Neverland. Once you're grown up, you can never come back. Never! I felt the same way that Walter felt when he was nine at teeny tiny bits. When you grow up, you lose all your magical, enchanted childhood times. This wasn't just a sentence. This was a complex sentence of a complex thought, of something that we didn't even see. And all of a sudden, it became clear to us. He's using these movies to make sense of the world he actually is living in, our world. But I said to Ron, you know, we've got to try and figure out if we can have him talk to us at all. So I go up to his room. I see Owen on the bed, flipping through a Disney book. And I see, sort of over to my left, I see Yago, the puppet. Now Yago is the evil sidekick to the villain Jafar from Aladdin. Now I know Owen loves his puppet. Jafar! Jafar! I grab the puppet, I pull it up to my elbow, and I begin to crawl across the rug as quietly as I can. And Owen turns to the puppet like he's bumping into an old friend. I say to him, Owen, Owen, how does it feel to be you? And I said, not good, because I don't have any friends. Now I'm under the bedspread. And I just bite down hard. You know, I just say to myself, stay in character. And I say, okay, okay. Owen, when did you and I become such good friends? And he said, when I watched Aladdin, you made me laugh. And then we talk. Uh, Owen and Yago for a minute, minute and a half. It's the first conversation we've ever had. And then all of a sudden I hear him say, I love the way your foul little mind works. That's the next line of dialogue. That's Jafar, the villain, to his evil sidekick, Yago. I love the way your foul little mind works. And then I run down and grab Cornelia. I'm like, he's memorized all the movies. I mean, he's memorized them all. If you throw him a line of dialogue, he'll throw you back the next line. And at that point, it was like a, a window opened, like a light went on. And we began to speak to him in Disney dialogue, the whole family. I memorized every Disney animated movie ever made. I memorized the credits, and that's how I taught myself to read. Felt like a great, wonderful world of enchantment. When we'd be down in the basement watching movies, when it would kind of all come together, where, you know, that's when we drew our own out. These were hand-drawn figures with exaggerated expression, exaggerated emotion. It was easier for him to interpret all of this. I think the idea that it never changes and everything else is changing constantly, every other part of his life. Our lives as his parents were getting older, you know, Walter's getting older, you know, people are dying, everything's changing. And that's the one thing that he can hang on to that never changes. OJ, Made in America, directed and produced by Ezra Edelman, produced by Caroline Waterlow. Do you think that there are members of the jury that voted to acquit O.J. because of Rodney King? Yes. You do? Yes. How many of you think felt that way? 
Oh, probably 90% of them. 90%? Yeah. 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 Did you feel that way? Yes. That was payback? Uh-huh. You think that's right? The majority of the world or the majority of Americans think that we're a group of idiots uh, who didn't get it right. I think that the jury was made to be the scapegoat for their faults. It was a mistake to present Furman the way they did. It was a mistake to let Darden get up there and be a part of that case. Had they come correct, had they had the right attorneys up there putting on the case that they need to put on, they would have won. It wasn't payback. They messed up. It may have been payback, but it wasn't payback for anything that happened recently. It was payback for what's happened over the last 400 years. It was payback for how black people are treated in America. I believe that that was on the minds of every black person in America. In a matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. Defendant or Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty. That, that, that was joy. You, you could hear it in the barbershop or the beauty salon, or in the classroom at the school, or on the streets. A release of breath, exhaling. Ah, the juice is loose. He's loose. He's loose. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. <laughs> It was like that day Jackie Robinson opened the door for black players. This trial tapped into the racial history of Los Angeles. I didn't realize how much it tapped into the national pain of race relations. <laughs> It was all so much bigger than we were. So much bigger. I think the Black Jubilation was very offensive and very hurtful. those films of African-Americans cheering and whites crying. It put a huge red line across society. Certainly the resentment that African-Americans have towards whites was shocking. It was absolutely shocking. Now you know how it feels. Thirteenth, directed and produced by Ava DuVernay, produced by Spencer Averick, produced by Howard Barris.
We are now in an era where Democrats and Republicans alike have decided that it's not in their interest anymore to maintain uh, the prison system as it is. Now all of a sudden, Hillary Clinton is meeting with Black Lives Matter activists and talking about it. It's time to change our approach and end the era of mass incarceration. She's made a major address on it. We will reform our criminal justice system from end to end and rebuild trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. President Obama going to prison, you know, as the first sitting president to ever visit a prison. We've got an opportunity to make a difference at a time when overall violent crime rates have been dropping at the same time as incarcerations last year dropped for the first time in 40 years. And conservatives who were always seen or understood within the narrative as being the tough on crime ones, um, have now uh, embraced justice reform. It's very uh, man bites dog. You see, Texas used to spend billions locking people up for minor offenses. We shifted our focus to diversionary programs like community supervision. Uh, we gotta ask ourselves, do we feel comfortable uh, with people taking the lead of a conversation in a moment where it feels right politically? Historically, when one looks at efforts to create reforms, they inevitably lead to more repression. And so if we leave it up to them, what they're going to do is they're going to tinker with the system. They're not going to do the sort of change that we need to see as a country to get us out of this mess. And they're certainly not going to go backwards and fix the mess that they've made because they're not ready to make that admission. But as a country, I don't think we've ever been ready to make the admission that we have steamrolled through entire communities and multiple generations when you think about things like slavery and Jim Crow and all the other systems of oppression that have led us to where we are today. So much fun, I love it, I love it. We having a good time? USA, USA. the crap out of him, would you? Seriously. Get him out. Get him out of here. In the good old days, this doesn't happen because they used to treat them very, very rough. And when they protested once, you know, they would not do it again so easily. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. That's true. Knocking hell out of that big man. The next time we see him, we might have to kill him. In the good old days, they'd rip him out of that seat so fast. Shut up! enforcement acted a lot quicker than this. A lot quicker. And we're going to enforce the law, and Americans should remember that if we're going to have law. I am the law and order candidate. Uh, we thought, I mean, they, they called the end of slavery jubilee. We thought we were done then. And then you had 100 years of Jim Crow, terror, and lynching. Dr. King, these guys come on the scene, Ella Jo Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, we get the bills passed to vote, and then they break out the handcuffs. Label you felon, you can't vote or get a job. So we don't know what the next iteration of this will be, but it will be, it will be, and we will have to be vigilant. I would like to ask the filmmakers of these extraordinary films to come up and join us for a discussion, please. Thank you.
that I don't, ultimately. I think, I think you're over, yeah. And then I fell. Wow, huh? How incredible were those films? <laughs> really amazing. <laughs> really amazing. So um, there's so many amazing people on this panel, and we don't have a lot of time, so um, I want to try to talk to all of you, and I want to talk to you, all of you for hours and hours, but unfortunately we, we are tight on time, so I'm going to ask if you could all just introduce yourselves and what your role was on the film and the film you worked on and produced and, or directed, and also if there are any characters from your film in the audience that you would like to recognize who are here, we would love to acknowledge their enormous role in the films that you made as well. So would you like to start? Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Gianfranco Rosi, I'm a director producer of Arazzi. And uh, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. We have here Dr. Bartolo, who just arrived today from Lampedusa. So Thank you, Pietro. It was a long trip, I guess. He's still like, he would like to be sleeping now, but... <laughs> and... Uh, she doesn't speak English. <laughs> so I, I say, she's the producer of the film, Donatella Palermo. <laughs> she's a very shy, because she's very sorry she doesn't speak a word of English. Però voglio dire una cosa, che in questo momento io sono commossa di stare qui con queste persone su questo palco. She's very perché moved to be here in this moment with all these people here on the stage. Perché sono tutte persone che credono che il cinema abbia anche una funzione etica politica e può cambiare il mondo. Because they all believe Siamo that's... Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Because they all believe that uh, f uh, documentary and film and cinema can still change the world, and we are all sitting here with this belief. So thank you so much for being with you. And this is beautiful. And the sensation to be on the same <laughs> side with people so <laughs> wonderful, incredible. It makes this world less cold and less ugly, but more beautiful. Uh, well, it's very hard to follow you. <laughs> Imagine me, she's my producer. <laughs> uh, my name is Eber Peck, and I'm a producer on I'm Not Your Negro. Uh, I'm Raul Peck, and I'm a uh, producer-director <laughs> of I'm Not Your Negro. And I am Rémi Grelti, and I'm the producer of I'm Not Your Negro, and I'm especially proud to be here tonight with such uh, filmmakers. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Roger Ross-Williams. I'm the director of Life Animated. And it's, it's so incredible because um, I'm so proud of my community because we have really sort of, um, as a community, by um, nominating these films that are so important, all of them, um, and representing the experience um, of the African American experience and, and the story of, of African Americans. And it's really, um, I think that we've, uh, we've sort of set a new, set the bar for the Academy from, from the documentary standpoint. So congratulations to you all. Here, here. I am Julie Goldman. I'm the producer of Life Animated. And I'd like to introduce Cornelia Suskind, who is here. Hi, I'm Ezra Edelman, the producer and director of OJ Made in America. I'm Caroline Waterlow. I produced OJ Made in America with Ezra. 
and it's a huge honor to be here. Thank you. My name is Spencer Averick. I'm the producer and editor of 13th. My name's Howard Barish. I'm the producer on 13th. And I just want to mention who's not here in person, but who's here in spirit because she's in New Zealand shooting her next film is uh, Ava DuVernay. Okay, thank you all. Um, and thank you again for being here. So I want to get right into it. So Juan Franco, talk to me about your film. My understanding is that you went to the island of Lampedusa for a long period of time, a good amount of time before you even started filming that documentary. Can you tell me why you decided to go there without filming first, why that was important to you? Well, um, for me it's always important to be in a, in a place first and trying to understand. But when I went to Lampedusa, I did know much about Lampedusa, as much, um, you know, people talked with through, the through the newspaper, the media, and there was uh, this island uh, which most of the time is not even represented in a map. You know, it's like out of the maps in Italy. It's very close to Africa. And uh, we all heard of Lampedusa is the beacon, is the place, first place where people arrive from Africa. And uh, for years, Lampedusa was always on the front line. But you know, most of the time, also the media uh, portrayed Lampedusa just related to the phenomenon of the migration and the good and the bad, sometimes with tragedies. But nobody really ever showed that this is uh, also an island with people living there. So for me, it was also important to, to change the point of view and tell you also the story of the people of the island, like Dr. Bartolo, that he's the first person I met when I was there and somehow drove me into this film. So for me, it was important to know the people and to see what was the, um, the identity of this place and what was the story of this island through the people passing by the island and to the people living into the island. So it took me one and a half year to be there from the beginning. Uh, the first three months I was there without a camera, trying to see if I was able to make this film. And then slowly, slowly I became engaged and devoted to, to the story that I was going to say, and uh, especially meeting the people that are in the film. Uh, Samuele, Zia Maria, Peppino, all the people that are in the part, and this enormous um, constant mass of people that they pass through Lampedusa, and to see also the relationship with this island and the people passing by, which uh, it changed uh, through the years. Because uh, when I started the film, also there was like a, the border of Lampedusa was moved into the middle of the sea. So the migrants didn't arrive anymore directly to Lampedusa, but they've been either rescued or saved in the, in the middle of the water and then brought into Lampedusa. So also this little island somehow is leaving a, 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 a separation between these two groups. And uh, Dr. Bartolo is somehow the link in between the people of the island and the migrants. So it was a very complex structure and, and, and really a very strong experience for me to be there and uh, be able in this one and a half year to tell the story, both of the people of the island and people arriving this island reaching for freedom and most of the time dying into the sea because we don't have, we have to remember that more than 27,000 people die in these last 15 years crossing the water from Africa to Lampedusa and more than 500,000 people pass by from this island which always opened itself to the migrants. So I thought this island becomes somehow the metaphor of this transverse phenomenon of the migration right now in the world. So how did you handle dealing with so many people who, who died during the course of your time there? Um, I imagine that was very difficult. Well, uh, um, I saw that many times when I was in Lampedusa, but I never wanted really to, to film that, the tragedy, except uh, there's a moment in the film, which uh, the whole film somehow was built to arrive to that moment where we see death because I really literally encountered that in the middle of the sea. I was for more than 40 days in this uh, Navy doing rescue in the middle of the sea. And uh, we did many operations there. And they did many operations. I was there witnessing and somehow sharing the, all the daily experience there. And one day death really literally came to me. And I was filming. I didn't know that we encountered this boat uh, completely lost in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. There were like more than 300 people on this boat. And at the beginning, it looked like it was like a regular rescue, like every day, sometimes more than 2,000 people are rescued into the sea, or sometimes even five, 6,000 even in a weekend. So it was one of the regular approach, and suddenly I see this body coming on my feet, and I had a split of the, of the second to decide 
do I want to tell this story? Do I want to show this? And then I did it. And uh, I also forced myself to go under this boat where we discovered there were more than 50 people die like in the chairman gas, like in during the Second World War. These people die fumed by the gases of uh, Putin, as Dr. Mator was describing very well. They're forced under the boat, and most of the time people, you know, without uh, the, 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 the breathe the, and the fume of the engine, and uh, they find death in a desperate and horrible condition. So I thought uh, it's unacceptable that uh, nowadays people find death in this way. And, um, and that's what the film is. It's a cry of help and say it's unacceptable that people die, try to reach freedom and try to cross the, 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 the sea. Well, I um, so appreciated your film. And, you know, I, I, we've all been exposed to this. It's, you know, the, the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time. And I so appreciate your approach to it and humanizing it and reminding us everything that's going on over there and, and, and what's at stake at the end of the day, which is these, these human lives. So thank you for telling the story. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we're, uh, I am not your Negro, Raul. I would love to hear from you. Uh, my understanding is you grew up in Haiti. Is that correct? Uh, well, I grew up in a lot of places. Yes, um, but Haiti, Haiti. I was born in Haiti and yeah. went to Congo when I was eight, and then to the United States, France, Germany. So, how were you first exposed to James Baldwin? Um, very early on, uh, I was still, a, you know, uh, not a teenager anymore, but I was 17, 18. Uh, on my way between finishing high school and going to university, to college. And, um, you know, people have been asking me that question and I try to find out how and know who, wha who gave me the first Baldwin book. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think it was a, a black American gay couple that I met in Berlin, my first year in Berlin, and we were always having those discussions about racism and, and in America, especially. And the type of anger that I felt they had all the time when the subject came up. And, and coming from Haiti, where we have a, s a different type of identity toward racism, um, probably through, uh, thanks to our history. Um, so I was telling them, you know, I, c I could not live being angry like this every day. And, and then they gave me the fire next time, which was my first Baldwin book, and and of course it changed my life and, and my way of seeing uh, these problems. You interweave, you take these these writings that were many decades ago, and part of your approach is to interweave them with more current day events. Many of which hadn't happened, I imagine, by the time you had started filming. So. Did the events happen and then you decided to bring it up to the current day or did you anticipate that events would happen and that that was always the idea going into the making of this film? Well, this film was really a particular film for me to make because it was like the concept was already there or the words were already there because those are the words I grew up with. And about 10 years ago, I felt that we were in a place, uh, by the way, not only here in the United States, but elsewhere in Europe as well. Uh, and we had of Trump in Italy through Berlusconi. Uh, that's exactly the same typical type of authoritarian uh, uh, behavior. Uh, and I felt like we were sinking in, s you know, uh, in sort of ignorance, of general ignorance. And the media was not really doing its job properly. And, and I felt like it was time f you know, to bring back those words, those incredible Baldwin words and analysis. Uh, and the film was for me, you know, how do I bring it in a cinematic form uh, for the big screen uh, so that a younger generation could again have access to it and, and have the same impact it had on me. So it was really, how do I construct that project? much more than, you know, go and shoot and, and try to find your characters and, you know, to build the film. It, it was really starting with the words. 
Well, it's beautifully done. It's really, it's really, a, it's really a poetry, you know. It's, so I'd like to open up to, to your team, Raul and Remy as well. Um, we're here in Hollywood, and um, we've struggled here at the Academy with race issues. Um, and, and I know Baldwin came to Hollywood many years ago and tried to have um, some films made and struggled with that. Can you all talk about your impressions of his experience here many years ago and how far have we come? <laughs> how about that one? <laughs> it's after the voting, so you don't have to worry about okay. what you said. <laughs> uh, well, actually, that's a similar question we hear a lot on, uh, during Q&As. Um, how much is, have, has, have things changed in America? And it seems like um, when we see the film, we feel that Baldwin has written these words this morning. So then that must mean two things, that he's an incredible writer, uh, and also that if those words that have been written 40 and 50 years ago is still have such meaning, that we still have a long way to go. Yeah. And maybe just to add that uh, we also produced this film from, uh, from France and from uh, Europe, and I think we were lucky to, to be able to do so because I'm not sure we would have been able to spend uh, that much time producing this film and offering Raoul and his uh, creative team that much time to actually make the film. If we were here in America, I'm not sure we would have been able to, to raise uh, uh, that much money only here. So. That's also to answer your question. Yes, I appreciate that. Um, well, thank you for an incredible, an incredible film, really, that um, I think transported so many of us to understand race in this country in a very different uh, light. So I appreciate your hard work and your incredible work. Yes. Um, so, Roger and Julie. Uh, Roger is our fellow governor, so, so it's great to have you up here as well, Roger. Um, so, my question to you, Roger, is prior to doing Life Animated, you had done uh, two films, one of which was won an Academy Award on Africa. And then, yes, and then you went on to make Life Animated which is, seems to be a different direction. So how is it, or not, how, <laughs> there's a lot of facial expressions yeah, going yeah. on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm just waiting till you finish so I can yeah, okay. correct um, you. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it that you decided on this film? Yeah, um, well, when I made Music by Prudence, um, Music by Prudence is about a, um, a young girl living with a severe disability who does not have use of her arms um, and does not have legs. And, um, when I, and she lives in Zimbabwe, where disability is considered witchcraft. So when I was making that film, I, I learned a lot. I, and it prepared me to make this film because I learned um, the importance of independence. Um, because um, Prudence lived in an orphanage with kids with severe disabilities, but they, independence gave them this sort of power, this sort of um, freedom, this sort of self-confidence that just sort of blew me away in a country with um, Mugabe and everything that was going, that they were going through. And so when I, um, when Ron came to me and said, um, you know, I had known Ron for a while, um, we, we had worked together as journalists, but when he told me the story of Owen, um, the first thing I thought about was that um, he, this is an opportunity to tell the story from, from Owen's point of view, and this is a possibility of really spotlighting independence and how important that is for someone who's neurodiverse to own their story, to um, be their own person, and uh, to, and, and Owen had, and Owen had this opportunity, I had this opportunity with Owen is to, to really have him sort of speak and represent um, people who are with who are neurodiverse and who are challenged in the world, and um, and so my goal was always to 
tell it from his point of view, to really get inside his head. And that was so important. And I think I learned that because I had made a film not so much about Africa, but though it was took place in Africa, but about the power of independence for people who have challenges in this world. So, that actually leads me to my next question for you, which is, you know, in my experience making documentaries, a, a huge challenge is always con figuring out the best way to connect with people, right? But you're working with somebody who is autistic and th where that can be a challenge. So what was your approach with Owen? How did you connect with him? How did you do the interview with him? How did you approach him? Yeah, um, well, um, I mean, I was, uh, to be honest, I was, um, uncomfortable at first because I didn't know how I was going to connect and, and I wanted Owen to tell his story but I didn't know how I was going to do that and then um, I thought of the idea of the Interatron, the camera invented by um, Errol Morris. And um, so, um, you know, Owen who spent his life looking at a television screen, um, connecting to a television screen, if uh, what an Interatron is, is it's a screen and I'm in another room and Owen is seeing me on a screen, so therefore he can look me right in the eye, he can, he can engage with me and tell the story himself. And, um, and then I would play Disney clips on that same screen and he can engage with those Disney clips. And when we, and that idea, we came up with that idea, it was like a eureka moment. It was like we, um, he was able to own the story. He was able to own the telling of his own story and, um, and you were, as an audience, because he's the only one who looks the audience directly, he looks directly into the camera, directly into the eye of the audience, you were able to really begin to get inside his head and slowly be drawn into his world and his reality and see the world through his eyes. Brilliant, brilliant. It's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> So, Julie, um, this film has had a wonderful life. It premiered at Sundance a, a, a more than a year ago and has had many screenings. I imagine Owen has come to a number of those screenings. Can you talk to us about what his reaction has been and how that journey, has that been a journey for him, what that process has yeah, been? Yeah, I think it has been a journey for him, actually, because I think none of, nobody knew what that experience would be. I mean, we knew that when Ron and Cornelia wanted to write the book that Owen um, was really the, the driving force in wanting to have his story told. So we knew that, but this is different because this is him connecting with audiences. And if he was here right now at this stage, he would be like calling on people, he'd be engaging, he would be leading it. I mean, that's what's really been kind of wonderful. And, and that's what happened with the Q and A's that I think might have been surprising even to Ron and Cornelia and to Walter. I, it was, he really flourished and there were just some incredible moments with screenings with him over the last year that I think are unforgettable for all of us. Um, and also interactions because there would be um, people who would get up and say, you know, I'm on the spectrum and this is the first time I feel like my story is being told. And that connection with Owen I think was really profound. And there were also people saying, I've never, I, you know, my, my sibling or, you know, my cousin or somebody in my life, I've never really known how to talk to them or look at them and think about them, what they're seeing. It was the same kind of a thing, and I think that was incredibly gratifying for him as well as the rest of the family. But there were some real doozy of screenings. <laughs> it's great. I'm sure, he's, he's a character. I've and he will also say, you know, he's looking for a new person, new girlfriend in the right. Boston, Cape Cod area. <laughs> you know, he's, it's like, a, it's a whole thing that goes on. It's great. No filter. I'm glad this film's working for him. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you know of anyone. <laughs> yeah. um, well, it's fantastic, and I just love that moment where the father talks to him for the first time. I mean, it's such a great documentary moment, so. R Ron does voices uh, as good as Owen almost. Yeah, um, well they all do, clearly. <laughs> they speak The whole family, language. Cornelia. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So, Ezra, OJ. Um, <laughs> so. I'm not sure the film has done as much for him as it has for <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um, we'll right, get I to don't that. know. <laughs> and, he, and presumably he's not here tonight. Um, so, you know, 
your take and your approach to this film was so interesting to me because I think if, you know, most of us were asked or decided to do a film on OJ, the sort of obvious way to go about it is, is you know, it's a murder case, a whodunit kind of structure it sort of lends itself to. You didn't do that at all, like at all. So can you talk to me <laughs> about what interested you in this story and kind of w your take on it and why you approached it the way you did, which was brilliant, by the way. Um, because I wasn't interested in the murder case. Um, and what interested me was initially, um, you know, how tired, I, I, weirdly, how tired I was of the conversation surrounding the murder trial. And so what I thought was um, that conversation was so reductive and even as we think about it today, it still sort of was thought of in a very binary way. And there were clear antecedents to how we got to that moment. And it was clear to me that in exploring it, this was this huge story, yes, about race in America, um, but it didn't start um, in 1991 when Rodney King was beaten and the trial happened a year later and the riots happened here. This was a story that had um, its roots in decades and decades of this fraught history in this city that went back to when um, so many black people migrated here and were confronted with the reality of uh, what happens here in Los Angeles as well as what happened in the Jim Crow South. And so there was that element combined with this incredible way to use OJ as a character as a lens through which to talk about our culture. And both from a race standpoint and identity standpoint, but from a celebrity standpoint. And his is a story about so many things that I think we all, that all affect us, that we all struggle with, ambition and identity and masculinity. Um, and, and frankly, that, that sort of quest to fulfill the American dream, which he did. And so there was, there was all these elements that when you started looking at the story, regardless of what was happening during the trial and what happened, whatever um, titillated people, when it came to the question of, oh, did he do it? It was, no, this is a story that really is about our country. And everything that we have struggled with, um, certainly in the last five decades, I really came very quickly to realize this was the defining cultural story of our time. And um, you know, it's, it's also somewhat counterintuitive because it, your approach to it, um, because it, it, we were so saturated with stories of OJ at that time. I mean, it was everywhere. We were, we all were living it day in and day out. And you know, you told this in seven and a half hours. <laughs> so talk to me about, about that approach as well. And let me tell you that it was a riveting seven and a half hours. I mean, I loved every minute of it, but it's, it is counterintuitive, at least for me. Um, which part? That it was long? <laughs> um. <laughs> I mean, look. Well, when just, you, you know, you, you told the story so fully and completely and broadly, which I understand was your motivation. But in, it, did you, when you started this, did you think, I'm going to tell this in an hour and a half, and then it got two and a half, and then it got longer and longer? Or was it, I'm telling an eight hour film, and I'm going to yeah. fill up that, that time? I mean, I think. I was offered um, an opportunity with a greater canvas. It started off as something that's going to be in the four to five hour range as far as concept. And so I think I wouldn't have done the film if I had been approached and said, if someone said, make a film about OJ, make it whatever you want to make it about, but it's going to be an hour and a half long. Because there would have been an understanding that it, it, it had to include the murder and it had to include the trial. And there's nothing you can do in that time that hasn't already been said. Right. And so for me, I was the same as you. I was tired of it and tapped out on it. And so the only reason I even attempted to take it on, the motivation was that I was being offered this greater canvas in which I could explore everything that happened before as well as what happened after. And so in the course of making it, you know, as everyone on the stage knows, when you go to make a documentary, you don't know what you're going to be able to um, find once you go out and, and start first researching and then shooting in terms of who would talk to us. This was a story that, you know, 20 years later, there are people who had stopped talking about it, hadn't talked about it since the trial, and sort of was very clear to me that it was going to be an uphill battle to get people to actually engage um, in helping us tell the story. 
And so with that, you know, we had the, all the ambition to tell this great story, but you know, how to tell a five hour film, we didn't know how to do that any more than we knew how to make a 50 hour film. So we just went out and started doing it. And then in the course of doing it, we gathered so much material that it grew and it grew and it grew. And luckily we were working with a company that allowed us to make the film that it needed to be. And that was a blessing. Um, Caroline, how hard was it to get people to be interviewed? And, you know, I think about people like Marf Mark Furman, who, you know, comes across as pretty potentially racist during the course of, um, you know, the trial. And how did you all approach somebody like him, and how open were people to, to talking to you all? Uh, well, it was challenging, definitely. Um, we had, um, I mean, first we sort of set about the, t the two big, you know, workflow issues. We're going to be gathering all of this archival material, and this film had sort of the opposite problem of a lot of d historical docs that I've worked on, where you're looking and looking and looking to find things, and this had so much material um, archivally. And then, obviously, the gathering of interviews, so we sort of divided that, and we had two amazing producers who worked with us, uh, Tamara Rosenberg and Nina Christick, um, and uh, we sort of set about those two tasks, and yeah, the interviews were, were very, very challenging. I mean, there were some people who took a year of talking to who did not agree to participate until, you know, a year down the road after we'd been working, um, and you know, there were, this film more than any other, I've, I've said this before, where, where there was a lot of, you know, please don't say no, let's just have coffee. Please don't say no. <laughs> just and, and there were a lot of people who said, okay, we'll give you, you know, would meet with Ezra and say, okay, I'll give you some background research, but I'm never going to do an interview. And then Ezra would say, well, okay, let's meet again, and maybe we'll, you know. And so there was a lot of that. Um, and we had to do a lot of work um, from f with people who had maybe had some terrible media experiences, uh, whether it was around the trial or prior to that. So we had to do a lot of work to get people to trust us. And, and I think once they knew we had this canvas and we were doing this much deeper, longer, uh, broader look at the story, they, they, they believed in what Ezra was you know, trying to do and they saw that what we were doing was different and, and, and you know, he prepared so amazingly for you know, he did over 70 interviews, um, and r we really, really wanted to do our homework so that people knew that we were serious about the, the take, you know, we were doing. Well, listen, it comes across, and it's an incredibly well-constructed film, and it's, as I said, riveting and, and just such an important story. So thank you for committing all the time and energy to making it happen. <laughs> okay, 13th. Um, I'm sorry Ava's not here, but you, you guys are going to represent the team beautifully, I'm sure. So, but tell her we missed her. Um, so, Howard, maybe you could start. And, you know, one of the things that's amazing about 13th is that you look through this history over 100 years in our country, and I feel like I know all of these events, you know, slavery and the civil rights movement and, and the police brutality. But you put them all in one place in a 90-minute or two-hour feature. And it, it says something so profound and so beautiful and meaningful and hard and horrible. Talk to me about that process. Ava, um, just I'm going to quote her so we have some sense of her presence in this room right now. But um, she, she called the film. Uh, a, a virtual tour of racism. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Well, when we started off on the film, you know, Ava said to me, before we start anything, I need you to read two books. One is called um, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, and the other is called Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, which if you people out there have not read that, it should be mandatory reading for everybody in this country. Um, it, you know, we started off wanting to take a macro look at the, uh, the American prison system, the industrial prison complex, and that led into, you know, the history of it and the racial disparities. And, and, and I think what, you know, and a lot of credit goes to Spencer, who edited the film, and, and Ava, 
I mean, they, he can talk about it more than I, but there, there, we had thousands of hours of footage. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, they found a way to connect the dots, I think is really what it is. And, you know, the, if you've ever been in therapy and you, they talk about the peeling of the onion and getting, you know, down to the layers, I think that's what was eventually successfully, you know, accomplished is that we peeled the layers of the onion back and we found a way to connect the dots and take you from day one in this country to where we are now. And, you know, I can say f on a personal level, it was a horrific journey. I mean, the things that I discovered and the, the eye-opening experience that I had through this process of learning the statistics and the history. I mean, I was a film graduate and I, I watched Birth of a Nation 35 years ago in film school, but never looked at it in the way that we approached it you know, in this film. So it's, it's uh, you know, I hope this becomes mandatory viewing, you know, in, in this country. I can tell you I get a dozen calls every single day from universities uh, and students around the country wanting to screen and discuss the film. So it's, 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 reach, it's, it's got a voice and it's reaching people. Well, I have to say, you know, there is something kind of extraordinary about watching I Am Not Your Negro and OJ and 13th and you know putting those all together and even though they're not necessarily directly connecting the dots it tells such a stunning story about race in this country and you know my feeling is that all of these films should be mandatory because they all say something that is so profound and important um, and interesting Spencer you know, as a, as a documentary filmmaker myself, I really appreciate a good editor. <laughs> you know, a lot happens in the edit room. So talk to me about working with Ava and what that relationship is like um, and how you guys work together in that edit room. Well, um, she's, I've been working with her for 10 years now or so and uh, she's become one of my best friends. She's you know, we're, we're filmmakers, we're collaborators, we, we just like to, to make films, and it's fun, and, um, and it, we take it very serious as well. So, you know, with this, um, it was the two of us um, looking at uh, 40 interviews, all two to three hours long, thousands of hours of archival. Um, you know, we didn't know exactly how we wanted to tell this story, um, in the beginning, but um, we, you know, I put together a cut that was probably about 10 hours long and just kind of string it out, see what we have, watch it, um, and we sort of came out of that and said, you know, here's the movie we want to make, and we needed to, to unpack it and move, move back to just after the time, um, after the Civil War, and, um, you know, it's just, it was a collaborative experience, and, uh, um, it wasn't her and me always in the same room together working, but, um, you know, we, we just, it was a long process, you know, I'm trying to uh, remember it all and, you know, it's just like, it was a horrific experience and <laughs> tedious and, you know, but um, we, we did it. Yeah, you did it, you did it. So, So the red light is blinking, telling me our time is out, unfortunately. So I want to just close by saying how extraordinary each and every one of your films are. And one of you is going to go home with that Oscar on Sunday, but I think we all agree that you're all winners in our book forever and ever, and really so proud of all of you. Congratulations. Thank you.